Chapter Three of Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Chapter Three, in which a conversation takes place which seems likely to cost Phileas Fogg dear. Phileas Fogg, having shut the door of his house at half past eleven, and having put his right foot before his left five hundred and seventy five times, and his left foot before his right five hundred and seventy six times, reached the Reform Club, an imposing edifice in Pall Mall, which could not have cost less than three millions. He repaired at once to the dining room, the nine windows of which open upon a tasteful garden, where the trees were already gilded with an autumn colouring, and took his place at the habitual table the cover of which had already been laid for him. His breakfast consisted of a side dish, a broiled fish with writing sauce, a scarlet slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a morsel of Cheshire cheese, the whole being washed down with several cups of tea, for which the reform is famous. He rose at thirteen minutes to one, and directed his steps towards the large hall, a sumptuous apartment adorned with lavishly framed paintings. A flunkey handed him an uncut times, which he proceeded to cut with a skill which betrayed familiarity with this delicate operation. The perusal of this paper absorbed Phileas Fogg until a quarter before four, whilst the standard, his next task, occupied him till the dinner hour. Dinner passed at breakfast has done, and Mr. Fogg reappeared in the reading room and sat down to the Pall Mall at twenty minutes before six. Half an hour later, several members of the reform came in and drew up to the fireplace, where a coal fire was steadily burning. They were Mr. Fogg's usual partners at whist, Andrew Stewart, an engineer, John Sullivan and Samuel Fallentine, bankers, Thomas Flanagan, a brewer, and Gautier Ralph, one of the directors of the Bank of England, all rich and highly respectable personages, even in a club which comprises the princes of English trade and finance. "'Well, Ralph,' said Thomas Flanagan, "'what about that robbery?' Oh, replied Stuart, the bank will lose the money. On the contrary, broke in Ralph. I hope we may put our hands on the robber. Skillful detectives have been sent to all the principal ports of America and the continent, and he'll be a clever fellow if he slips through their fingers. But have you got the robber's description? asked Stuart. In the first place, he is no robber at all, returned Ralph positively. What? A fellow who makes off with fifty-five thousand pounds? No robber? No. Perhaps he is a manufacturer, then. The Daily Telegraph says that he is a gentleman. It was Phileas Fogg, whose head now emerged from behind his newspapers, who made this remark. He bowed to his friends and entered into the conversation. The affair which formed its subject, and which was town talk, had occurred three days before at the Bank of England. A package of banknotes, to the value of fifty-five thousand pounds, had been taken from the principal cashier's table, that functionary being at the moment engaged in registering the receipt of three shillings and sixpence. Of course, he could not have his eyes everywhere. Let it be observed that the Bank of England reposes a touching confidence in the honesty of the public. There are neither guards nor gratings to protect its treasures. Gold, silver, banknotes are freely exposed, at the mercy of the first comer. A keen observer of English customs relates that, being in one of the rooms of the bank one day, he had the curiosity to examine a gold ingot weighing some seven or eight pounds. He took it up, scrutinized it, passed it to his neighbor, he to the next man, and so on, till the ingot, going from hand to hand, was transferred to the end of a dark entry, nor did it return to its place for half an hour. Meanwhile, the cashier had not so much as raised his head. But in the present instance things had not gone so smoothly. The package of notes not being found when five o'clock sounded from the ponderous clock in the drawing office, the amount was passed to the account of profit and loss. As soon as the robbery was discovered, pick detectives hastened off to Liverpool, Glasgow, Havre, Suez, Brindisi, New York, and other ports, inspired by the proffered reward of two thousand pounds and five per cent on the sum that might be recovered. Detectives were also charged with narrowly watching those who had arrived or left London by rail, and a judicial examination was at once entered upon. 
there were real grounds for supposing as the daily telegraph said that the thief did not belong to a professional band on the day of the robbery a well-dressed gentleman of polished manners and with a well-to-do air had been observed going to and fro in the paying room where the crime was committed a description of him was easily procured and sent to the detectives and some hopeful spirits of whom ralph was one did not despair of his apprehension the papers and clubs were full of the affair and everywhere people were discussing the probabilities of a successful pursuit and the reform club was especially agitated several of its members being bank officials ralph would not concede that the work of the detectives was likely to be in vain for he thought that the prize offered would greatly stimulate their zeal and activity but stuart was far from sharing this confidence and as they placed themselves at the whist table they continued to argue the matter stuart and flanagan played together while phileas fogg had valentine for his partner as the game proceeded the conversation ceased excepting between the rubbers when it revived again i maintain said stuart that the chances are in favour of the thief who must be a shrewd fellow well but where can he fly to asked ralph no country is safe for him sure where could he go then oh i don't know that the world is big enough it was once said phileas fogg in a low tone cut sir he added handing the cards to thomas flanagan the discussion fell during the rubber after which stuart took up a thread what do you mean by once has the world grown smaller <laughs> certainly returned ralph i agree with mr fogg the world has grown smaller since a man can now go round it ten times more quickly than a hundred years ago and that is why the search for this thief will be more likely to succeed and also why the thief can get away more easily be so good as to pay mr stuart said phileas fogg but the incredulous stuart was not convinced and when the hand was finished said eagerly you have a strange way rafe of proving that the world has grown smaller so because you can go round it in three months you in eighty days interrupted phileas fogg that is true gentlemen added john sullivan only eighty days now that the section between rothal and allahabad on the great indian peninsula railway has been opened here is the estimate made by the delhi telegraph from london to suez via mount sinis and brindisi by rail and steamboats seven days from suez to bombay by steamer thirteen days from bombay to Calcutta by rail three days from Calcutta to hong kong by steamer thirteen days from hong kong to yokohama japan by steamer six days from yokohama to san francisco by steamer twenty-two days from san francisco to new york by rail seven days from new york to london by steamer and rail nine days total eighty days yes in eighty days exclaimed stuart who in his excitement made a false deal but that doesn't take into account bad weather contrary winds shipwrecks railway accidents and so on all included returned phileas fogg continuing to play despite this discussion but, but suppose the hindus or indians pull up the rails replied stuart suppose they stop the trains pillage the luggage vans and scalp the passengers all included calmly retorted fogg adding as he threw down the cards two trumps stuart whose turn it was to deal gathered them up and went on you are right theoretically mr fogg but practically practically also mr stuart i'd like to see you do it in eighty days it depends on you shall we go heaven preserve me but i would wager four thousand pounds that such a journey made under these conditions is impossible quite possibly on the contrary returned mr fogg well make it then the journey round the world in eighty days yes i should like nothing better when at once only i warn you that i shall do it at your expense it's absurd cried stuart who was beginning to be annoyed at the persistency of his friend come let's get on with the game deal over again then said phileas fogg that's a false deal stuart took up the pack with a feverish hand then suddenly put them down again well mr fogg said he it shall be so 
I will wager the four thousand on it. Calm yourself, my dear Stuart, said Valentine. It's only a joke. When I say I'll wager, returned Stuart, I mean it. All right, said Mr. Fogg, and turning to the others, he continued, I have a deposit of twenty thousand at Bearings, which I would willingly risk upon it. Twenty thousand pounds, cried Sullivan. Twenty thousand pounds, which you would lose by a single accidental delay. The unforeseen does not exist, quietly replied Phileas Fogg. But, Mr. Foggs, eighty days are only the estimate of the least possible time in which the journey can be made. A well-used minimum suffices for everything. But in order not to say exceed it, you must do mathematically, from the trains upon the steamers, and from the steamers upon the trains again. I will jump mathematically. You are joking. A true Englishman doesn't joke when he is talking about so serious a thing as a wager, replied Phileas Fogg, solemnly. I will bet twenty thousand pounds against anyone who wishes that I will make the tour of the world in eighty days or less, in nineteen hundred and twenty hours, or in a hundred and fifteen thousand two hundred minutes. Do you accept? We, we accept. accept, replied Messrs. Stuart, Valentine, Sullivan, Flanagan, and Ralph, after consulting each other. Good, said Mr. Fogg. The train leaves for Dover at a quarter before nine. I will take it. This very evening? asked Stuart. This very evening, returned Phileas Fogg. He took out and consulted a pocket almanac, and added, As today is Wednesday the 2nd of October, I shall be due in London, in this very room of the Reform Club, on Saturday the 21st of December, at a quarter before 9 p.m., or else the 20,000 pounds, now deposited in my name at Bearings, will belong to you. In fact, and in right, gentlemen, here's a check for the amount. A memorandum of the wager was at once drawn up and signed by the six parties, during which Phileas Fogg preserved a stoical composure. He certainly did not bet to win, and had only staked the twenty thousand pounds, half of his fortune, because he foresaw that he might have to expend the other half to carry out this difficult, not to say unattainable, project. As for his antagonists, they seemed much agitated, not so much by the value of their stake, as because they had some scruples about betting under conditions so difficult to their friend. The clock struck seven, and the party offered to suspend the game so that Mr. Fogg might make his preparations for departure. I am quite ready now, was his tranquil response. Diamonds are trumps. Be so good as to play, gentlemen. End of chapter three.